And we can also see that in any spinning objects. Uh, let's take a tennis ball. Uh, let's take a baseball. I guess I'll start here with the tennis ball. What's the whole point and the advantage of a tennis player taking their racket and as the, the ball's coming and they go to hit it, at the same time they hit it and rotate their wrist in a forward direction. So they hit it and rotate. Uh, that means the tennis ball then is heading this way with a spin in this direction. It's also why a new tennis ball is so much better than a worn out tennis ball. Because this fuzz here has to be just the right amount. Um, actually, I would like if my tennis ball even had more fuzz. Because it interacts with the air. But there's a certain limit of how much fuzz you have. But as it wears off, you want a new tennis ball. Because this spinning, the fuzz grabs the air. And I'm hoping you see that it would be grabbing the air and forcing it underneath. And as it forces it underneath, this is where the air is flowing faster. This is the low pressure. And the low pressure then would then be in opposition to the high pressure. The high pressure here would then push the ball down. And so what's nice about this is then by doing a hit like this where I rotate forward and it spins this way, uh, we call that a top spin. And so this top spin as it flies along is going to actually make the ball drop down faster than just gravity alone. And so the aerodynamics plus the gravity really make this ball drop. And of course the advantage of the in the game of tennis means that what I can do is I can now hit the ball extra hard. And as I hit it extra hard and rotate my wrist, that ball can still drop down and land in the court. Because if I hit it really hard and it goes out of the court, it doesn't do me any good. I, I, I don't win the point. In fact, I, I lose the point. And so I got to be careful not to hit it too hard. But if I really do want to hit it, but I want it to land in the court, so then I have to do this top spin. And that's the idea of a top spin. Or the other way around. What if I start the match or the game or the point and I go to serve the ball and if you know a little bit about the game of tennis uh, I would be starting on one side and serving towards the other so you do kind of a diagonal serve and of course then my opponent is waiting for it over there they know I have to hit it over in that direction but if I want to then Know, get my opponent to have to go way over to the side so maybe when they return it I can then go to the other side of the court and win the point. How could I get them to go out besides just hitting it there I can spin it. And so if I, if I come up and I go for my serve and as I hit the ball I rotate this way with my racket. And maybe a combination of hitting it over the top and rotating it this way. So that the over the top makes the ball drop so I can hit it a little bit harder. But the side of it, the, the side swipe of it makes it spin. As the ball goes this way, it is spinning. And if you watch this ball spin in this direction, it would be catching the air and pulling it to one side. And in this case, it would be this side. This would be the low pressure. This would be the high pressure. And so the high pressure is pushing it that way. And so as this ball is spinning, it's going to then land with a, 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 a speed in the sideways direction. Now, I didn't give it a speed when, in sideways when I hit it. I mean, maybe a little bit because I am trying to get it over that way as far as I can. And so I'm going to take my opponent and say, okay, I'm going to try to get you that way. So I have to hit it that way. But because of the spin, as it is flying towards my opponent, it's getting more push this way. And so by the time it bounces and by the time it gets to my opponent, it's got a lot of speed that direction out of the side of the court. And, and my opponent's got to run way over to, to get it. And of course, hopefully that draws my opponent way out so that the return is kind of weak and then I can hit it the other side and the chances of them running all the way and getting a, a good hit is, is, is highly un, unlikely. And so I can use the, the spin. And you might be able to see that if I grab this beach ball, which is a little bit easier to spin and a little bit easier to see here in the, in the uh, room. If I, if I take this beach ball and I, and I try those two things. Maybe I'll stand here on the table so you, you can see it go down. I'm going I'm to hit this beach ball and I'll, I'll hit it kind of like this. I'll just kind of go, leave it up there and go wham. And so I'll give it this top spin. And so as it goes along, as it spins, 
it is also then pulling the air underneath it, and this thing drops real, real quickly. I, I mean, watch this. And so I'll take this and go. And, 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 and look at it. It went like this, and it just looked like it just died. It just, it just dropped. Now, so you can compare this. What would have happened back here if instead of me giving it a top spin, I gave it a back spin? So I hold it up and I hit it like this. And so it spins this way. Now that's not a good idea for a tennis ball. Because as the air flows over the top, you're going to get low pressure here. And, and that's going to then lift the ball up. And so you can compare the two. I want you to see how much it lifts up. But if I had a baseball and I was trying to hit a home run, this would be the approach. As my bat comes through with a little downward angle on it, I can get that backspin on the ball. And that backspin then would help the ball stay up in the air, the aerodynamic effects. And so besides going a long distance because of a good hard hit, it'll go even further because of the uh, backspin. The same thing for a golf ball, and I thought I brought a golf ball out here, but I didn't, so imagine this ping pong ball is a, a, uh, a, a golf ball. But if I were to hit the golf ball, again, I want the head of my golf club tilted back a little bit. So as I hit it, it will then have this backspin, and that will catch the air, and the aerodynamics will, will keep it in the air. Well, let me try it with the beach ball here, so you can kind of compare here. And so if I, if I take this beach ball, Maybe stand about the, the same place. I don't need to get on the table for this one. Watch how it stays in the air on this one. And that backspin just, just keeps it floating, whereas the top spin made it uh, dive. And so depending on what I want to happen, and of course a, a pitcher could do the same thing. Uh, they could throw a, a fourth seam fastball. They can make it kind of rise up a little bit on the, on the batter. Or they can spin the curveball and they could drop down on the, on the batter. And so it's hard for the batter to, to hit it. You know, or they could spin it sideways, like I, I need to show you here. And they can make it curve, a, a slider, and it slides a, across here. And so same thing here, that if I uh, pretend I'm making a tennis serve or I'm throwing a, a slider, if I get it to spin, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this ball and I'm going to hit it. And, and, but I'm going to hit it kind of like, like, like this. So it has a little bit of forward, so it'll go that direction. But watch as it goes that direction with the spin going this way. It's going to then take the air around this side, and there's going to be low pressure on this side, which makes the high pressure over on the, the other side. And so it will then curve kind of out towards what I'll call the audience, but all I have is a camera here today. So, but out here into the, to the crowd of, of people. So I'm going to try to get it going straight first, and then hopefully it'll arch over a little bit. Oops, my... Got it going up, so it hit the light. But but I am hoping that that can, you can kind of see that on the on, on the on the video. Maybe I should actually hit that one towards the camera. Maybe maybe it'll be a, a little more uh, clear if I go towards the camera on on something like this. So maybe I'll, I'll come over here and kind of face the camera and start off with a hit towards you, but with that spin. And so it starts off and then it it it, it arches over there. Well. Uh, there's a lot of fun things to talk and do with Bernoulli's principle, but maybe I should call it quits for this chapter, given uh, that we're a little uh, behind here, and move into the next one. But like I said, these, these three chapters, uh, chapters 11, and now 12, and now 13, are all about the structure of, of matter. So why don't I call it quits here for this chapter? And so... I'll move into chapter 13 now. We're not too far into the lecture. That's good. So we can get a lot started here with uh, 13. No way can we I'll finish 13. But we can get a good jump into 13. And I hope what you're, you're getting out of all of these is you can see that the, the physics of all of this is really based down in the, in the structure of matter, how the molecules are hooked together. And this chapter was really all about fluids, how the, how the fluids are kind of hooked together. All right, well, with that said, why don't I erase this and say, all right, 
there's your two main principles of your fluids, your Archimedes principle and your Bernoulli's principle. Uh, take that information and you have some really good homework questions and some good applications of how these uh, two ideas are, are used. And so now let's, go, now let's go into chapter 13. And uh, chapter 13 uh, will be the last of our three chapters on the, the structure of matter. We're going to shift gears next time. And it is entitled Thermal Energy. And some of this chapter is, I'll say we've already done. Uh, I don't want to say it's obvious, but maybe it is obvious because we've already been talking about it. And I would say it always comes down to that kinetic theory that these are made out of little atoms or molecules and they, they jiggle around. If you warm them up, they go faster. You cool them down, they, they slow down. Maybe now you're beginning to see why uh, Feynman answered, as I said earlier, if there was one piece of information that would be passed to the next and surviving generation during a pandemic or a nuclear holocaust. You know, what would be the most useful? And that's why Feynman answered it that way and that's why I think it was a great answer and I like it too that probably the most important piece of science really is uh, that the atoms or that there are atoms, these are these microscopic objects and they jiggle around, jiggling faster with higher temperature. And you see how much application that is. And you'll see that here in this one. And so I'm going to start off with a statement that is hopefully at this point obvious, but it's where your author starts. Your author says, heat is a energy. Now I'm going to take you way back to chapter 7. You might remember that in chapter 7 I was putting the little brass weight on this corner right here. I was letting it fall and I said that hey when it starts it has 10 joules of gravitational potential energy. And as it falls down it always has 10 joules of energy. It just loses gravitational potential energy and as it's falling it goes faster so it gains kinetic energy. And so someplace between the top and the ground it always has a total of 10 but it is losing gravitational potential energy and at the same time gaining kinetic energy. And then when it hit the ground, the impact of that brass into the concrete on the floor made those atoms start jiggling faster. In other words, where did the energy go? The jiggling of the atoms. So did we lose any energy? No. But it might appear that way at first. It might appear that way because as it hits the ground and comes to a stop, we would say, hey, it stopped. It doesn't have any kinetic energy. It's down on the ground, so it doesn't have any gravitational potential energy. So it's gone, right? All the energy is gone. And if you don't consider the microscopic heat of it, that is the movement of the atoms, you would think the energy is gone. And the early scientists, that's what they thought until they finally figured out that heat is a energy. And so this statement is actually a very revolutionary statement in the history of, of science. But for us, I don't think it's that surprising. We've been talking about the molecular kinetic energy and what we call the kinetic theory for a long time. So heat is an energy is not really a surprise, I don't think. So I'm going to just, you know, put it on the board because it is such an important idea. But like I said, not too surprising given the way we uh, presented this class and the way we've already presented the kinetic theory. Also, maybe not a big surprise then, is to say we can then use the law of conservation of energy. And again, not a surprise. I mean, if heat's an energy, it would fit into this chapter 7, the conservation of energy. In fact, I would say we've already been doing that, right? I'll go back to this brass weight. We put the brass weight up there, we let it fall, and we said, well, 
ultimately the 10 joules that started at gravitational potential energy eventually became heat energy. That is, it became the molecular motion of these atoms once it hits the ground. And the, the reason we said it was 10 joules is because it started with 10 joules of gravitational potential energy. And so if I use the principle of conservation of energy, then it must have 10. So again, I don't think that's very revolutionary. But again, the early scientists didn't really quite understand that. They, you know, to them it was revolutionary to say, hey, heat is an energy. And because of that then, they said that the heat energy together with the other energies like gravitational and potential energy must be a constant. They called this the first law of thermodynamics. And I will then also put here the first law of thermodynamics. But as I said, it's I think the way we present our science today and the way we give the kinetic theory way, way, way back in, in chapter 7, this isn't a, a surprise here. And so know this, that if I were to take a piece of hot aluminum, and just for demonstrations, let me grab my block of aluminum, alright, maybe I'll move this over to here and say, okay, here's my block of aluminum. Oh, let's imagine that's a hot block of aluminum. And I take this hot block and I put it next to a cool or cold piece of, oh, how about I pick on lead. And I put them together. And so here I have my lead. Again, I don't think it's a big surprise to you, but when you put a hot object next to a cold object, what happens? Doesn't the hot object cool down and the cold object warm up? Exactly. This then would say something like this. Heat energy then transfers from the hot object to the cold object. I don't even know if we even have to say the word heat energy. We, we, you could just say energy. Energy goes from one object, the hot one, into the cold one. And this one right here, if it loses energy, oh, let me put a number here. Why don't I say it loses 10 joules of heat energy? Ah, did you catch that? What units did I use to measure heat energy? Joules. Again, not a surprise. What unit did we use to measure energy way back in chapter 7? Didn't we measure kinetic energy in joules? Didn't we measure potential energy in joules? Yes. And how do we measure heat? Because it's an energy in joules. Okay. So let's say the hot object loses 10 joules. Then what does the cold object gain? How much does it gain? Does it gain less than 10? More than 10? Equal to 10? I hope you're saying equal to 10. This is because energy is conserved. You, you, you can't just get rid of one joule of energy. You can't say, hey, this one loses 10, but this one only gets 9. No, well, well where's the other one? This is called the first law of thermodynamics. The conservation of energy. Whether it's heat energy or electrical energy or potential energy, doesn't matter. Energy is conserved. And so this first bit of this chapter, as we begin to talk about thermal energy, I, I think is pretty easy to digest because it really is nothing more than what we've already been doing. We've been doing conservation of energy. Just here forward, 
when we conserve energy and we're talking about thermal dynamics, we'll just call it the first law of thermal dynamics instead of conservation of energy. Because again, the, the early scientists, you know, didn't really recognize that. They just you know, realized the heat energy was conserved, or I should say they realized heat was conserved. And then later they realized it was an energy and so they're like, oh, well, then the first law of thermodynamics is really the same statement as conservation of energy. Right. And, and so that's what I'm, I'm trying to say here. So as we do some experiments, and tomorrow we're going to do a lab experiment, and we're going to take advantage of this. We're going to know that if the hot one lost 10, the cold one gained 10. And we will then say it's because of conservation of energy. Or we could say it's because of the first law of, of thermodynamics. Now, I do want to be a little careful with some words here. Because heat often gets confused with internal energy. And maybe I should even call it heat energy, but again, hopefully that's obvious. Heat is an energy. And it even gets confused with temperature. And I want to point out, these are not quite the same thing. Close, yeah. Uh, related, sure. Which is why I think they get confused a little bit. So, let me do an analogy here. Let's say that I have $20 and you have no money. And I give you 5 I lose five, you gain five, right? Our total money's conserved. It was 20 and zero. Now it's 15 and five. But heat then would be represented as that five. The heat is the amount of energy that gets transferred. I lost five, you gained five. And so the, the best way to describe heat is to say heat is the amount of energy flow. How much actually moves? So in this weird analogy of money, the answer is five. The amount of money that moved from me to you is five. I lost five, you gained five. That's what I was calling here by heat. Heat is this 10. This one lost 10, this one gained 10. But internal energy. This is the total amount of energy that the object has. It is not the amount that gets transferred. So in my silly analogy here, this would be like my $20. I have $20. I then give you five. So I am now down to 15. So my, my money right here, my internal energy started at 20. And after I gave you five, it went down to 15. So this is how much I actually have. This is how much is actually transferred. You see that difference? In other words, back here, this hot piece of aluminum, if you added up all the energies of all the atoms that make up this block, this may actually be something like 180 joules of energy in the whole thing. So when it gives up 10, it now has 170. And so this 180 dropping down to 170 is the internal energy of that piece of aluminum. But the heat is the 10. The heat is the amount it transferred. And again, according to conservation of energy, then this cold one that maybe only started with 50 joules of energy now increases to 60 joules of energy. Because again, you gave it 10. So its heat is 10. 10 is the amount that was transferred to it. Its internal energy was low at 50 and now has increased up to 60. And so you can see that these hopefully are different but can easily get mixed up. See, 
I gave you five. But I have 15 left over. Don't confuse the 15 with the five I gave you. Those are two different things. In fact, the internal energy really has two numbers. It, what do I start with? Well, I start with $20. What do I end with? I end up with $15. And so my internal energy drops down by the amount of heat. And so again, very close. Don't confuse them. Now, maybe it's obvious, but both of these then are in energy. And so they would be measured in units of a joule. And so we are going to measure heat in joules, as I already mentioned, not a surprise. And again, we're going to be measuring internal energies in joules. And again, since it's an energy, it's not a surprise. However, this might be a surprise. Sometimes we will measure these in something called a calorie. Now, we should talk about this calorie because it is not really part of the metric system, but it is still very useful. And so I would say it's still kind of hanging around here. It, it just is, as I said, really useful. I'm even going to go one step further. Don't confuse calorie with calorie. They are not the same. What's the difference? Well, it's hard to see on a whiteboard, but I hope you can see that this I have written with a capital C and this one with a lowercase c. And those, because of the slight subtlety between a capital C and a lowercase c, can easily get confused. Um, I'll even go one more that we're not going to spend too much time, because again, not part of the metric system, but what we call the British thermal unit, also referred to as a BTU. And of course, this is part of the empirical system, like PSI, um, like foot, like inches, like miles. And so in the science class, we don't really say too much about it, but it still is very useful. And you see it a lot in engineering. And I probably half of you, or even more than half of you, your ultimate educational goal is to go into engineering, not into to science. And so you probably will use a lot of empirical units, a lot more than a scientist would in their metric system. And so you gotta be careful with that. And of course, switching back and, and, and forth here. And so let me just put down here B, T, U. But let's talk about all these. And I want to point out that all of these are units of energy. The best one, I'll say it hands down, the best one is the joule. You've already been introduced to a joule. That's kind of been the standard of measuring energy in the metric system. But we have some other ones that can also be very useful. And I would say these first two, the joule and the calorie, really are very useful. And so even though the calorie is not officially part of the metric system, you will see it is very, very useful. And we're going to use it a lot in this chapter and in further chapters. Those of you going into engineering, you will see that the BTU can be very, very useful. So let me talk about the small calorie first. The small calorie, which we will label as CAL with a dot, so we just abbreviate a calorie, is an energy. So I like to say it is the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. 
And you can then maybe see the history here. I'll come all the way back here. Remember when I started this chapter, I was saying the early scientists, this, this was a revolution for them to really know that heat was an energy. Had they known that heat was an energy, they probably never would have used the word calorie. They would have used joule because they knew joule was the unit for energy. All they knew in the early days was that the energy, where are we on time? Oh, we're great on time. The energy is then moving, oh, excuse me, they didn't know it was energy. Uh, they just called it heat. They didn't call it heat energy, just heat. Uh, they just said something called heat is moving from the hot one to the cold one. And so that's something they called heat. But again, they didn't call it heat energy. They just called it heat and so they needed a way to measure it. And here's how they decided to, to measure it. They decided that if you were warming water, now of course in my little diagram, I put lead. But if this instead of lead was water and it was one gram and it went up one degree, they would say, hey, we must have transferred heat, not heat energy, heat of one calorie. And so they defined a calorie as a certain amount of, they, they didn't call it energy, they called it a heat, but now that we know more I'm going to call it a heat energy. So it's the amount of heat energy that is needed in order for one gram of water to go up one degree. Oh, let me draw a picture here. Let's just say that I had right here hot one gram of H2O. Uh, maybe it's about 90 degrees Celsius. And I put it in contact with, <laughs> I'll kind of treat it like water is a solid. I know, I know it's not, but I, but I put the hot water with the cold water. Obviously, if it's a liquid, I'd pour them together and stir. But I'll say here I have some cool water. Let's say it is 20 degrees Celsius. And so here's H2O and I still have one gram. And at first what's going to happen is this hot one is going to drop one degree. And that right there, when it drops one degree, tells me that one calorie moved out of the hot object. It would then make the cold object go up one degree. And so that's what a, a calorie is. A calorie is the amount of energy needed, and I said raise, and that's true, but also cool because of conservation of energy. So whether it raises at one degree or cools at one degree, if it raises one degree, it needs the energy. If it cools one degree, it must release that energy. And so this is releasing one calorie, this is gaining one calorie, that's my conservation of energy. And you can see how I'm using this word calorie as a form of, of energy. Now I'll leave it there, but you could imagine it would not stop there. This eventually would go down to 88, which would make this one go up to 22. Uh, this would then go down and that would go up and energy would keep transferring and we can then label that in either joules or in, in calories. So it was Joule himself, uh, along with some others, who begin to start this whole revolution and begin to look at thermal dynamics and begin to look at this and say, you know what, I think what science is missing is that heat is an energy. And so Joule ran a, a very famous experiment where he tries to show that he can convert kinetic energy into heat energy. Or potential energy into heat energy. Now of course in those days they weren't calling it heat energy, they were just calling it calories. So he warms up some water. And it turns out that he finds that if he put a big bell of hay up in his barn and he let it come down, it would lose gravitational potential energy. 
and he hooked it to a rope and a pulley and he put it in a bucket of water and he let the bucket of water get stirred and as it stirred it around it warmed up the, the water. And it turns out that after he did this a number of times on average, he was able to show that the energy of potential is converted into heat. And so not only was he able to show heat as an energy, he was actually able to get some numbers that said the relationship. And so this is the mathematical relationship. And so that's why today we have these multiple units for heat energy because we didn't know that a calorie was actually measuring an energy. We just thought it was measuring heat. We didn't know heat was an energy. But once this great discovery took place, and then of course he proposes this idea of conservation of energy, and of course that's why he gives this great honor of naming joules after him. But we begin to see that there is a mathematical connection. And so you'll need this. Uh, we'll need this in the lab. You'll need it on a few homework problems where you're going to have to convert because you know how to calculate energy for kinetic and potential in terms of joules. But then you go to warm up water. And this is where calories become useful, right? Because calories right here is the amount of energy to warm up one gram one degree. So if I had something like this, if I had say five grams of water and it warmed up three degrees, how much energy would that be? Well, that's pretty easy. That's just 15 calories, right? See, because each gram, there's five of them, would need a calorie to go up a, a one degree. So if all five of them go up one, that's five calories. If they go up another degree, that's another five. And they go up another one, that's another five. So five, five, and five is 15. And so that's why I would claim the unit of calories is actually very useful. Because most of the stuff, most of the liquids, most of the chemistry, if you have an exo or endothermic reaction in chemistry, most of that stuff in the test tube or the beaker is water. And so measuring things in calories is really, really, really very useful. So this is a long way of saying that we have more than one unit of energy. We will actually use these other ones. We're not going to throw them away. The calorie is worth keeping. It is so useful and so powerful that even though it's not part of the metric system, it is really, really, really nice. It's, it's a little bit like the same reason we haven't gotten rid of a week. A week doesn't fit into the metric system really.